Welcome, everyone. All right, um, people who have the L last name, you're not picking up your paper. So if you have an L last name, please double, triple check. There's like full of L's, OK? All right, let's start off with current events. Hi, guys. Happy Thursday. <laughs> it's week four. Um, geez, this, this quarter's going by too fast. Um, OK, current events. Who has a current event? I know you all know a current event, because big things have happened lately. Recently, studies have shown that Selena Gomez's problems are caused by uh, Justin Bieber. <laughs> oh, Mr. Manish, you're so funny. Interesting. Um, <laughs> does anyone have an actual current event? <laughs> so, um, in California jails, um, they are actually sterilizing women. Um, so that's a current event. I don't know what you all think about that. Yeah, and you guys could definitely look up more than that. But um, in California, here's a fun fact. Well, it's not fun. It's really morbid. Um, when prisoners are pregnant, they give birth with handcuffs on. I don't know if any of you guys knew that, but in the state of California, that's what they do. OK, another current event. Who has one? I know there's news regarding Beyonce. Does anyone want to? I know you guys know about it. Who wants to inform us? She got um, Time's cover, the cover of Time magazine, 100, 100 Greatest People, the first woman of color to grace Time's cover of 100 Greatest People. Um, I think that's a really big issue going on right now. We have another current event. Um, to go along with that, um, People magazine just released their like most beautiful people, and Lupita Nyong'o actually got first place. And there's actually a lot of backlash from I don't want to say racist, but racist people saying that she can't be beautiful because she's 100% black. So that's, that's pretty intense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in my backpack. Do you want me to? Okay. So does anyone else have another current event? Um, the, the woman who goes on tour with Beyonce, Iggy Azalea, who's heard, who's heard of her? She sings like a really famous song called Pussy. It's like actually one of my favorite songs ever. Um, <laughs> it's really problematic too. But um, she, sh the, she has stopped crowd surfing. Does anyone know why she has stopped crowd surfing? So just say it. I yeah, she was, getting, she was getting sexually assaulted while she was crowd surfing. So that's why she has stopped. And... Um, yeah, and she goes on tour with Beyonce, and they're both very open about their sexuality. So it's intense. All right. Are you ready? To yes, I'm ready. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, the, in the syllabus, uh, I know some of you got the first and second edition. And so I put the actual pages um, on that for the second ed first edition. So actually, the pages are in the second edition as well. And I'm going to read it out. It's going to be The Ways of Seeing, page 269. And also, uh, Gorilla Girls, How and Why the Gorilla Girls Have Altered the Art World. That's page 277. Okay. So I try to pick things that are in both, in both editions that way. And somehow I, I put it on the first edition. But I know you got, you, some of you have first edition, some of you have second. So they're in both editions. OK. All right, great. All right. So current events, we did that. OK. So let's do our kind of like uh, Gorilla Girls. So we're going to do um, In my mind, I'm the best dancer ever. We need to figure out this dancing situation. <coughs> you know, I think I caught something from Patty. It's not feeling so good, so I'm just gonna stay home. You're full of shit. Look, Fred actually invited you tonight. You've been trying to get close to him forever, and here's your non-stalker's chance to do it. Fine. 
You're right. Besides, you're not the only person in the world who can't dance. I'm an okay dancer, but what makes me a great dancer? This. I hate to say this, but hair is the best thing to happen to rhythmless non-blacks. See, you just work for hair, and nobody knows you can't dance. Oh. Right. Sorry. You know what, just forget it. I'm just, I got him a card, I'll give it to him at work. No big deal. No! You're giving it to him. In person. Tonight. And then you're gonna make out with him. Get dressed! We're leaving. I hate parties. They're so competitive. A blatant contest of look, style, and sex moves. I'm so above that. There he is! Go! Go! Friend! Jay, you made it! I just think I need a flower. It's not a big deal. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you. Is it weird that I glued the card shut so he'd need my help? Damn, girl! How do you feel who made dresses? Shit. <laughs> Nina, you're not at work. <laughs> well, it's Saturday night. Have you been taking our dress? I cannot get this card open for nothing. Oh, it's just, you know, you can I can help with that. Um, I... Oh! Happy birthday, friend. <laughs> Thanks for being the reason I haven't quit. <laughs> That's so cute. Another work reference. Thank you, Jay. Look, look, grab a drink. Enjoy yourself, okay? She want it, I can tell she want it. Told me to push up on it, cause she know where I'm all on it. We get the party going, liquor flowing. Everybody from the office is here. Why did I think I was special? Why is Nina dancing with Fred? My comebacks weren't fast enough. Is she trying to get pregnant? Let's get out of here. This party is lame. No, it's not. I'm having a great time. You need to loosen up. Get a drink. Go dance with some hot guy. Thirsty bitch is dancing with my hot guy. Hey, what's up? Oh, what's up, Papa? I'm Animal. I'll be Cece. What'd he do? Uh, it, it do, I guess. That's what's up, boo! That's what's up! I'm a, hey, I'm gonna go get some. I'm gonna go get some drinks. You stay like right here. I'm about play on. Why does Cece sound like a contemporary slave? What was that? Black guys love when I talk like that. He walked off. He's getting his drinks. See? Oh hell no! <laughs> Great. Now I'm by myself. <laughs> Standing alone at parties is the clearest indication that nobody wants you. Should I try to make friends? Do I need to act like I'm having a great time? Are people looking at me? Maybe if I dance next to this guy, he'll recognize his urge to dance with me. If this party is a competition, I'm losing. Could things get any worse? I brought you a drink. I'm allergic, so. But you were drinking the night we passionately made love. We did not fucking make love. We had sex! <laughs> it was a fucking mistake. I don't ever want to see you again. I was drunk. So, get the fuck out of my life. Cece's right. I need to loosen up. Um, here, let me, uh... There you go. What's up? Oh, Beautiful. This is the 
no, 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 that, that's, that's a shitty thing, sorry. I was talking about the way you said, uh, motherfuck. Um, I can't do it, but it, it had like a, like a melody to it. It's beautiful. Motherfuck. <laughs> I'm Jay. So am I, that's so... <laughs> to dynamite! <laughs> uh. Okay, cause like, cause you're Jay and I'm Jay. So it's JJ. So, you know, dynamite! Good times. Fucking lame. That's so cool. <laughs> it was fucking lame. <laughs> I'm so awkward. I'm, I'm awkward. Like, you don't even know. No, you were motherfucking beautiful. <laughs> hey, I see you met my boy Jay. What's up, man? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to hit the dance floor and get my Dougie on. Are y'all coming? I don't know. Yeah, Dougie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just went into the thought though, because you just seem like. Like, like I have rhythm. Yeah, I don't know, like, not to be weird. It's like about a burden it. for me. <laughs> like, I would never do this, but not because of any reason. Did I just see what I thought I saw? No way. Fred couldn't be. I'm here. <laughs> yeah, okay. Come up here, man. You know, I remember the time when we was in high school, dude, we was on track team. He coached me in this room, man. And the socks was wet, man. Some extra socks that I took a bed. And I gave him the room, so. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Slow song, you wanna give it a shot? Sure, why not? <laughs> Even if we only go to my house. Nothing like a cute white guy to make me feel secure about my dancing. Wait, is he looking at me? Could it be? Is Fred suffering from a bad case of dick envy? All it took was ready for action. I changed my mind. The worst thing about parties is watching the guy you like kiss the girl you hate. Alright, so that is the number one voted video on YouTube. And also it's, a, it's very relevant for our class because it's a form of Gorilla Girls. Alright. Which on the internet. All right, um, all right. So um, it, uh, my um, my apologies. Uh, the 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 numbers were actually on the first edition, but this is the second edition. It's in both editions. So if you have the first edition, just go by the syllabus. If you have the second edition, it's actually these pages. So I just put it up on an announcement, so you should have it twice. Okay. All right. Ways of seeing by John Berger. Who's actually read the book? Has anyone is an art major? Is anyone an art major? Okay, this is quite a famous piece. All right, uh, can someone read the slide? Ways of Seeing by John Berger. John Berger, art critic and cultural historian, changed how people see art, addressed issues of diversity, patriarchy, and class. All right, so it basically it's required reading and if you are art major or if you're in cultural studies or if you're into postmodern um, 
things. Um, John Berger's book, Ways of Seeing, uh, this is actually an excerpt from his really famous book about art, right, and how we see art. And he basically like, changed art because, um, in terms of how, how people perceive art, because he said that actually the way we see art is actually has a lot to do with ourselves, right? So art is not just a flat plane that's objective, it's quite subjective, actually. All right, can someone read it, the slide? Seeing. Seeing comes before words. The relation of what we see and what we know is never settled. Excellent. So is that true, guys? Do you see things before you see words? Or do you, do you see images first, generally? Right, so this is one of his arguments that seeing comes before words. And then uh, what we see and what is actually there is ne never settled, right? Because there is the issue of yourself, right, and your own view. And that also affects, like, what you are actually viewing. And this is probably well known to art majors in our class. All right, the way we see is affected by what we know and what we believe. So can someone uh, read our slide, um, it, it actually read our cartoon and break it down. You can read it and break it down. I would read it, but I can't see it if it's not big. <laughs> Can you read the inserts? She's going to read it. Okay, I'll read it. <laughs> the way we see is affected by what we know or what we believe. And the woman on the left says, everything covered but her eyes. What a cruel male-dominated culture. And the woman on the, um, oops, right. <laughs> 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 that was the blonde woman. Um, the woman on the right says, nothing covered but her eyes, but a cruel male-dominated culture. Right, do you see, can we break down this uh, slide comic for us? Uh, they're both kind of uh, objecting to each other, right? Because they both think they're objectified or um, in, in some, some form of sexism. Can someone break it down for me? What, what does this slide mean, or the comic? Um, it's like explaining people's different perspectives on the same concept. Like, it's all about how you perceive it and how, like, what your eyes see. And, and you, can, you two can be looking at the same thing, but diff think different things. Can you break down? Why does the, uh, the woman in the risque bikini, why does she think the other woman is oppressed? Ask me. Um, because she's showing every, like, the only thing, she's showing everything besides like what's covered and that's to kind of, I guess, like, um, that's for like the male, the male dominated his eyes. Whereas the woman who's covered up, she's covering herself up because of probably what males, how males want the females to look in that society or in that country. Excellent. Um, in our culture, your well, woman's sexuality is embraced, and um, basically it's like the saying sex sells. But in other cultures, such as the one on the right, um, women like to preserve themselves because it's usually they believe that it's just the man that should look at their husband or their spouse that should look at their body. So um, it's a, basically a different, like a difference in culture. Right, excellent, great. All right, so th very much your background affects what you see. In this case, there are two different women from different cultures, and they, they see the same thing differently. All right, um, can someone read the slide? <laughs> Mr. Rami, you, do you want to know? Okay. Um, <laughs> we can only see what we look at. To look is an act of choice. When we see, we can also be seen. Images are made up to conjure something that is absent. When we see a landscape, we put ourselves there. All right, let's break the first one down, okay? Is it true that we can only see what we can only see? Right? So if we can't see it, then it's, is it not there, or okay? Or we, we can't see it, okay? The second thing is to see is an act, is a choice. Is that true? 
But what if you live in certain societies where you have advertisement and things are kind of in your face, etc.? Is that a choice? Particularly the guys who've, who've traveled. Who, who's been to India? Who's been to India? Mr. Manoj, um, Aziza Sarah has a really great like a piece. I, I, I play it right now, but I can't find it. But uh, he talks about how when he's like in India, it's like there's not that much sex and violence on the you know advertiser, right? But in America, it comes back. It's like all in your face, right? So, um, what do you guys think? Do you think that as a country that we have a lot of sexual content in our media and also our commercials versus other countries? What do you guys think? Sorry. <laughs> I actually wrote a, um, an essay on that uh, about how our, the children of our culture are exposed to a lot of things that they really shouldn't be exposed to. And um, I grew up in a household where I wasn't really guarded from, like, the adult television or, or you know, the risque stuff on television because it was as if I was going to find out anyways, you know, at elementary schools that I went to because um, there are obviously some more lenient parents than others. So it was like kids talked about it on the playground, even if they had no idea what they were talking about. They like said like all of these um, these I guess not appropriate things for children. And I wrote it in my essay that when parents try to hide these things from children, I grew up with um, children whose parents tried to hide like all these bad things, like bad things from them, and the children actually acted up. So. I think that like a lot of bad things are seen in our culture, but we we don't have the power not to see them just because even if we do expose ourselves to it or if we just hear it from other like any other people, we're still getting exposed to it. So there's no really like way to guard it. Even though we are like I I do think we are more open about like sexuality and stuff like that in our cu our culture, but I don't think that's a bad thing as well. Good points. All right, does anyone have any other opinions? Uh, this country does have a lot of advertisement, uh, particularly of women, right, in risque outfits. Test, test, okay. So I think, like, the issue in at least American society is that we, not necessarily the content, but the way it's presented, like, like I mean, we don't have a lot of actual, like, nudity is extremely frowned upon in our society. Like, we can be, like, I don't know, like, softcore is totally fine for us, but any, like, a nipple shows up, there's a huge problem, but in other countries, that's like, they're like, why? It's just the human body. But we sexualize the softcore already so much, it just, I don't know. It's hard to explain, but I think, um, yeah, I just think it's very interesting that, also, especially with violence in our country, like, we also sort of glorify it a lot more than other countries. And it's not necessarily the fact that we have guns, it's just the way that we picture the people using guns in our, sh in our commercials, our television, our movies, et cetera. Good know. point. Okay. All right, let's look at the second one. Okay. Images are made up to conjure up something that is absent. Um, what do you think of that? John Berger argues that s images are actually uh, made up. So I want you guys to think of things that you've seen in uh, these advertisements of women, uh, particularly in kind of magazines, right? Has anyone heard the concept of Photoshop? <laughs> right, so those women look nothing like, right, the image that you see on the cover, right? Uh, they're completely Photoshopped, right? So uh, what is this? Can someone comment on this? Um, you know, this is like a you know, million dollar industry of these magazines, right? Uh, especially beauty magazines, right? But these images are not real, right? So they're conjuring something that's absent. These women don't exist. Can someone comment? Yes. Um, there's actually, I don't know like what country, but there's this male um, makeup artist who actually is like encouraging women not to get like, um, what is it, Botox and stuff like that. And he's showing them ways to use makeup to enhance their, you know, what they believe are flaws. And there was like so many pictures that they posted. It was like on Yahoo or something. And these women literally look like they had gotten surgery, but it was all through makeup and stuff. So he was trying to encourage them, like, don't go and do all these things to yourself and maybe, you know, har or, um, you know, affect your health rather than just using makeup and actually, you know, creating these, v or whatever, the way you want people to, s to see you, I guess. Good point. All right, so John Berger is actually quite famous. Uh, if you all go to grad school and you do some sort of social science, uh, particularly if you take anything art-related, uh, you actually will read this book. So let's uh, listen to his documentary and 
Women dream of themselves being dreamt of. Men look Men dream of women. Women dream of themselves being dreamt of. Men look at women. Women watch themselves being looked at. Women constantly meet glances which act like mirrors, reminding them of how they look or how they should look. Behind every glance is a judgment. Sometimes the glance they meet is their own, reflected back from a real mirror. A woman is always accompanied, except when quite alone, and perhaps even then, by her own image of herself. While she is walking across a room, or weeping at the death of her father, she cannot avoid envisaging herself walking or weeping. From earliest childhood, she is taught and persuaded to survey herself continually. She has to survey everything she is and everything she does, because how she appears to others, and particularly how she appears to men, is of crucial importance for what is normally thought of as the success of her life. A woman in the culture of privileged Europeans is first and foremost a sight to be looked at. What kind of sight is revealed in the average European oil painting? There were portraits of women as there were portraits of men, but in one category of painting, women were the principal ever recurring subject. That category was the nude. In the nudes of European painting, we can discover some of the criteria and conventions by which women were judged. We can see how women were seen. What then is a nude? In his book on the nude, Kenneth Clark says that being naked is simply being without clothes. The nude, according to him, is a form of art. I would put it differently. To be naked is to be oneself. To be nude is to be seen naked by others and yet not recognized for oneself. A nude has to be seen as an object in order to be a nude. In the European oil painting, nakedness is not taken for granted as in archaic art. Nakedness is a sight for those who are dressed. That is why Manet's painting, which really marks the end of the period I'm considering, is so profound a comment on all the works which preceded it. The story begins with the story of Adam and Eve as told in Genesis. 
And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And she gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And the Lord God called unto the man and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Unto the woman God said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Two things are striking about this story. They become aware of being naked because as a result of eating the apple, each sees the other differently. Nakedness is created in the mind of the beholder. The second striking fact is that the woman is blamed and is punished by being made subservient to the man. In relation to the woman, the man becomes the agent of God. In medieval art, the story is often illustrated scene following scene, as in a strip cartoon. During the Renaissance, the narrative sequence disappears and the single moment, which is nearly always depicted, is the moment of shame. The couple wear fig leaves or make a modest gesture with their hands. But now, their shame is not so much in relation to one another as to the spectator. It is the spectator's looking which shames them. Later, as painting became more secular, many other subjects offered the opportunity of painting nudes. But always in the European tradition, the nude implies an awareness of being seen by the spectator. They are not naked as they are. They are naked as you see them. Often, as with the favorite subject of Susanna and the Elders, this is the actual theme of the picture. We join the Elders to spy on her. She looks back at us looking at her. Sometimes the woman, Susanna, looks at herself in a mirror, picturing to herself how men see her. She sees herself first and foremost as a sight which means a sight for men. Thus, the mirror became a symbol of the vanity of women. Yet the male hypocrisy in this is blatant. You paint a naked woman because you enjoy looking at her. You put a mirror in her hand and you call the painting vanity. Thus morally condemning the woman whose nakedness you have depicted for your own pleasure. And thus, incidentally, repeating the biblical example by blaming the woman. The judgment of Paris was another favorite mythological subject with the same inwritten idea of men looking at naked women and judging them. Paris awards the apple to the woman he finds most beautiful. Beauty in this context is bound to become competitive. The judgment of Paris is transformed into the beauty contest. Aesthetics, when applied to women, are not as disinterested as the word beauty might suggest. I don't want to deny the crucial part that seeing plays in sexuality, but there's a great difference between being seen as oneself naked or seeing another in that way and a body being put on display. To be naked is to be without disguise. To be on display is to have the surface of one's own skin, the hairs of one's own body turned into a disguise, a disguise which cannot be discarded. Amongst the tens of thousands of European oil paintings of nudes, there are perhaps 20 or 30 exceptions, paintings in which the artist has seen the woman revealed as herself. This Rubens. This Rembrandt. This Georges de Latour. These paintings are as personal as love poems, and their character is quite distinctive. Most nudes in oil paintings have been lined up by their painters for the pleasure of the male spectator owner who will assess and judge them as sights. 
Their nudity is another form of dress. They are condemned to never being naked. With their clothes off, they are as formal as with their clothes on. Those who are not judged beautiful are not beautiful. Those who are are given the prize. The prize is to be owned, that is to say, to be available. Charles II commissioned this secret painting from Lely. It's like hundreds of others. It might be Venus and Cupid. But in fact, it was a portrait of one of his mistresses, Nell Gwynne. It shows her passively looking at the spectator, staring at her naked. Her nakedness is not an expression of her own feelings. It is only a sign of her submission to his demand. The painting, when he shows it to others, demonstrates this submission. His guests envy him. By contrast, in another tradition, nakedness is a celebration of active sexual love as between two people. The woman as active as the man. The actions of each absorb the other. In oil painting, the second person, or the second person who matters, is the stranger looking at the picture. Compare the expression of these two women. One the model for what is considered a masterpiece by Ang, and the other an ill-paid model for a photograph in a girly magazine. Or these two. Just the expression, the look. What do you see? It seems to me that in each pair the expression is remarkably similar and that it is an expression of responding with calculated charm to the man whom she knows is looking at her, although she doesn't know him. It is true that sometimes a painting includes a male lover, but the woman's attention is very rarely directed towards him. She looks away from him, or she looks out of the picture towards he who considers himself her true lover, the spectator owner. This painting was sent as a present from the Grand Duke of Florence to the King of France. The boy kneeling on the cushion and kissing the woman is Cupid. She is Venus. But the way her body is arranged has nothing to do with that kissing. Her body is arranged in the way it is to display it to the man looking at the picture. The picture is made to appeal to his sexuality. It has nothing to do with her sexuality. The convention of not painting the hair on a woman's body helps towards the same end. Hair is associated with sexual power, with passion. The woman's sexual passion needs to be minimized so that the spectator may feel that he has the monopoly of such passion. There were paintings which depicted male lovers. These did exist, but they were mostly private, semi-pornographic pictures. In most paintings which were painted to be seen rather than hidden, the only rival to the male spectator is a Cupid. And how extraordinary it is that the pictorial symbol of passion was a small boy. For a similar reason, women in the European art of the oil painting are seldom shown dancing. They have to be shown languid, exhibiting a minimum of energy. They are there to feed an appetite, not to have any of their own. The appetite was theoretically gargantuan. The absurdity of this male flattery, although it was not seen as absurd then, reached its peak in the public academic art of the 19th century. Prime Ministers discussed under paintings like this. When one of them felt he had been outwitted, he looked up for consolation. The nude in European oil painting is usually presented as an ideal subject. It is said to be an expression of the European humanist spirit. I don't want to reject entirely the truth of this, but I've tried to add to it, starting off from a different viewpoint. Dürer, who believed in the ideal nude, thought that this ideal could be constructed by taking the shoulders of one body, the hands of another, the breasts of another, and so on. Was this humanist idealism? Or was it the result of an indifference to who any one person really was? Do these paintings celebrate, as we're normally taught, the women within them, or the male voyeur? Is there sexuality within the frame or in front of it? 
I showed the program, as you have seen it up till now, to five women. It began to seem absurd that the only images you were seeing were of women silent, mute. So I showed it to them and asked them to comment, to comment not so much on the program, but rather on the questions raised by it. Above all, on the question of how men see women or have seen them in the past and how this influences the way women see themselves today. We have an image, of course we all have an image of ourselves and it's a visual image. Uh, but I wonder how much this sort of classical European painting has shaped that image. In my own case, I find it quite impossible when I look at the paintings that you show in your film. I can't take them seriously. I cannot identify with them because they are so immensely exaggerated always. You know, they fasten on to some secondary sexual characteristic, you know, these enormous breasts and sort of great big beasting bottoms, you know, and those huge <laughs> things like that, and they just aren't real. Whereas with photographs, um, you, you, can, you can feel that is potentially, that's possibly me, although no, it, it probably isn't. But these, these, nearly all the paintings you have shown, um, are what is called idealized. Um, and therefore, they are, to me, very unreal in connection with, with any deep down image that I might have of myself. And in all right, so that's a good um, intro to his book. So I do want you to link what you just saw to what you see at the grocery store and uh, what that, that says about women and uh, are, they the, are, are they the seer or are they to be seen, okay? So in one, many cases, uh, John Berger kind of talks about how we have many prisons, right? And I, I think I talked to Mr. Uh, Manoush about this. Uh, prisons that, that make us see certain things, right? So um, what are your prisons? And I guess I'm um, just been going on the long. Uh, what, are, what are things that affect your seeing? Okay, so take a moment, write down five things that affect your seeing, like how you see things. Because <clears throat> one of the big arguments that Berger does is that how you see things is affected by your background. So another way to look at it is prisons. Those are things that hold you back. You don't see exactly what is there. Okay, so p put down five prisons that you have that affect your seeing things. Right, so keep writing, and then we'll have uh, Miss Alyssa. Um, can someone read it? These are some uh, prisons that I thought of, but um, please, someone read it, and you can add your own as well. I'll just read it because you guys are—I know you guys are writing. Um, number one, prison of history. Number two, prison of time. Number three, prison of geo geographics. Number four, prison of family. Number five, prison of culture. Bleep person, mental prison, you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. I didn't want to put a cuss word. But um, <laughs> so guys, do you think that there's a, the way you see things is a product of history, right? We're in 2014, you're very different from your, your grandparents, right? You see things totally different, right? Okay, so you have a historical prison, right? You're here and you're at a very technology advanced place, okay? What about time? Is that, is that affecting how you're seeing things? If it was 1800, would it be different from now, 2014? Okay, what about geographics? Does it make a difference that you're in a first world country, that you're an elite college student, 1% of the planet, versus if you're somewhere else? Let's say in Dominican Republic, we talked about last time, or in Thailand, or around the world? Does, that, does your, being here, does that affect how you see things? Yeah, okay. What about family? Does your family affect you? Is, is that a prison? Like how you see things, like what your mom said to you and what your dad said, and does that affect your thinking? Okay, culture as well, okay. And the, 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 one of the deepest prisons is your own mental construct. Looking at you guys, do you think that your mind constructs a certain reality? Specifically you as well, okay. So would you guys say these are all different prisons? Okay. 
Um, again, I, I think that it's, a, it's good to be aware of them, right? Um, all right. All right, so definitely these prisons affect what you see, right? So you just saw a very famous, uh, actually really famous documentary uh, by John Berger. And all of you probably saw it differently, right, from your background, right? And in 100 years, people will see it differently, okay? All right, when we look at images, we're affected by what? Can someone read it? Anyone? Beauty, truth, genius, civilization, form, status, taste, etc. All right, so this is, I think you have recognized this, David, very, very famous, right? Uh, do we have an image of what is beautiful and what is ugly? What is truthful, what is not truthful? What is considered genius? What is not genius? Okay. What is civilized? Right, civilized art versus not, okay? And is it affected by taste and status, okay? So again, this is really interesting. This is what John Berger brought to the table, and that's why uh, we will read his book in 100 years from now, right? He says that these are things uh, that we're affected by, and, but we have a prison to interpret, is it art or is it not art? All right, so Berger's arguments. Can someone read it? Women must continuously watch themselves. They were taught this since childhood. Men survey women before treating them. Men act and women appear. And she turns herself into an object. All right, guys, let's get into the discussion right now. What do you guys think? The first one. Women, uh, if you, there are many genders, but if you identify as a female in class, do you continuously watch yourself? One of the things that I thought was really interesting in his um, video was that he had said that um, everything is like a mirror, especially like um, other people's glances at you, because the way that you look at somebody, like I can look at you and smile and be like, oh, okay, I look fine. If I look at you like weird like this, and you're going to think, oh, my God, is there something on my face? So like everything is always a reflection. And so if you're walking by like the hub and then like there's a bunch of like the way that the windows are tinted, you kind of look at yourself like, oh, okay, I don't have toilet paper trailing for my shoe, uh, and stuff like that. So uh, you're constantly, like, watching yourself because if you were to have random toilet paper coming from your shoe, people would look at you and think you're weird or, like, oh, she's so stupid. Or okay. So it, it's women trying to be perfect. And then uh, one of the things that I had um, thought about the whole airbrush thing is, like, the reason that they do that and try to do like a fake perfection is because then everyone's going to try to keep competing with each other to get as close as they can without actual Photoshop so that they can be like, I did this, I got this far, and you're still back there. Great point, great point, excellent. Anyone else? Any women that, that they, you can you see yourself? Yeah, there's back there. Where's the, where's the second one? There's two. Second mic, let's pass it up. So go ahead and then we'll- Wait, I actually have something to say about the third one, oh. the third point, is that okay? Okay, um, sure. Um, I, well, I've spoken to many guys and like, I mean, just like friends and everything. Over time, I've been able to, I guess, observe that um, they configure what they want their relationship to be with a, with a woman just from looking at her. Oh, interesting. So interesting. they, um, I guess, well, I mean, generally speaking, obviously, because I'm sure some men are different, but um, if they see a woman that, like, they either think of her lustfully or they think of her, I mean, they, if they think she's beautiful, then they could be like, okay, well, I might want to pursue something more with her. But if they don't feel like there's some sort of attraction towards them, then they might not even waste their time. Interesting. You know, Great so it's point. like, I guess, I know a lot of men are blinded by just, like, what they see and they're not willing to explore other facets of a woman just by, you know, making their judgment quickly on what they see. Excellent. That's a great point. Thank you. I guess you could pass it up, that mic. Actually, uh, guys, there's, our, there's books on this, actually. There's an anthropologist uh, from the University of Michigan who actually traveled around the world, and he asked men what they found as attractive or beautiful. And it was actually startling results, guys. Uh, ladies, um, apparently men, uh, they don't like it when your eyes are like here or here. They like them symmetrical eyes together, okay? So symmetry is a huge issue for men around the world. Do you guys believe that's true? Okay. Also, uh, men apparently like um, symmetrical features, of course, but they like big eyes, 
right? And that has something to do with fertility, right? Because the younger you are, you have big doe eyes, but you get older, they get smaller and shrivel to grapes. But anyway, all right. Also, men like smaller noses. That seems to be an international norm, I guess. Um, and uh, it's, this is probably shocking for a California audience, but uh, apparently this book you could just go through and buy it but uh males like lighter skin of that ethnic group right so let's say you're in africa uh, it's not someone who's blind blind but it's a lighter skin of that ethnic group right and so you can understand if you're in anthropology they tend to be more fertile right the older you get the darker your skin goes right um pretty interesting they also like bud lips uh very interesting and uh strangely enough uh ladies uh, there he says he argues that males can smell your fertility like how fertile you are by sitting next to you. So not to creep you out right now, but the males can smell you. <laughs> on the flip side, they have done uh, some studies on what females find attractive. And it's not facial features, ladies. What do females find most attractive about males? Personality. If only that was true. <laughs> no. Sorry, I'm with you, bro. Let's think of fertility. Anthro majors. Uh, Sociology readers, sadly, around the world, it is a commonality. Women tend to like males. You have a lot of what? You say hair, mustache? No, 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 no. Muscles, no. Money, unfortunately, yes. Uh, so there, there was a. Um, it's not necessarily money. It's whatever is the the, the commodity. So let, let's say it's young mamo. They like the guy that has the most yams. Right, so so whatever, but in Western society, it's it's money, right? And this is well, uh, um, I think, played out in, in online dating. All right, anyone else? I think a hand back there. Can you comment, Mr. Aaron? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just uh, talking to Kendall about this real quick when um, I saw females raising their hands, and it was interesting to see that uh, right before girls raise, uh, it's kind of a general observation, but right before girls raise their hand and the mic gets to them, they kind of fix their hair fix their appearance oh and goodness. it was just really interesting to see and I asked Kendall why was that and then it was kind of just like from a girl's perspective she said you know girls always kind of want to constantly keep that good image before uh, other people just like look at them you know like w when they have the mic all the Andrew when they have the mic then um, kind of everybody looks their way you know and so it's there. I guess it kind of goes <laughs> with the number one women continuously watch themselves to kind of present themselves as the best that they can be right there you guys were fixing your hair. I didn't notice. You guys were fixing your hair before you were on the mic. Okay, thank you, Mr. Aaron. I, that's a great observation. Okay, so you're saying our guys don't, they don't care. They didn't, they didn't fix their hair at all. I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, guys, I guess we have another way to kind of present ourselves. And I kind of notice it, not even just in class, but like walking around, you know, like when you're walking and then you see a girl walking by and then she looks, or you guys make eye contact, she kind of fixes her hair too and this and that. And then guys, they tend to like lick their lips or whatever, you know, something. <laughs> what? I mean, not kind of just like to, yeah, I don't know. Our guys lick their lips. Okay, thank you. I, I didn't know that. You guys, not like <laughs> you guys yeah. lick your lips. I what? What is the point of that? But okay, all right. Um, great. Thank you, Mr. Aaron. That's a deep comment. Okay, anyone else? Um, oh, that's loud. I wanted to make a comment about what you said earlier about how men, um, like nationally, like women who are ethnic but of lighter skin. I actually took a dance class and um, they talked about who, like hula, the dance, right? Okay. So um, <laughs> they actually, hula like originated, you know, so long ago, but then it started to become popular in America, not because of the people actually like the dancing, but because um, Hawaii used it as more of like a tourist play. Like they wanted, um, and they didn't even have like um, the, a like a full Hawaiian woman um, do the dancing. They had like a ha ha I think it's pronounced Hapahalo women do it because they were half Filipino or half Hawaiian or whatever and um, half white. And so they looked, they obviously did look ethnic. They looked of a different ethnicity, but they still had like this pale, familiar skin. So it, they still had this exotic thing, but they were more familiar because they were more pale. And that's, I read something like that, so I wanted to mention that. But also, um, I don't really, I don't really agree with um, women constantly watching themselves because, I mean, I'm a first year, don't get me wrong, but I get up five minutes before I go to class and I, I just walk to class like on campus. I don't really watch myself, you know. Um, 
And it's the same thing. I don't feel any different when I come to class, like, without any makeup on and talking to someone I just met. Because I agree with the boy in the back that it is about how you carry yourself. Like, he says guys carry themselves differently. Well, I think that, like, girls can carry themselves differently. And if they have a certain confidence, then it really, no one ever really notices if you're not wearing makeup, if you're confident about, well, like, what you're saying. So I don't really agree with this that much. But okay, that's my great. opinion on it. Mr. <laughs> oh, Renouge, great points. Just give me a second to fix my hair. <laughs> Lick your lips. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. okay um, I think it's personally like when Dr. Bond was talking about the prisons of the mind, like it's a fear construct. Like um, we perceive what we fear essentially. Like um, our fear is what holds us back. And like uh, when you acknowledge that fear is like the main factor of most of your problems you'll understand that the only way to like do something about it is to like love it because love and fear it's okay i can't talk about this because it's just like too deep like it could go on, <laughs> it could go on for ages you know like but you could read wikipedia articles on love and fear and then you'll see like how interrelated they really are thank you mr news you drive our class so thanks for your comedy and deep thoughts um, part of what he was saying about fear is kind of just like for the whole you were taught since childhood is you're kind of raised with oh you're gonna meet somebody and you're gonna get married and then you're gonna live happily ever after you're gonna like make money together and you'll be financially stable whatever and so I thought it was interesting how he was saying in the video that women want women dream about being dreamed about whereas men just dream about the women so the women are like since childhood taught that it's good and like the best to have people chasing after you to have people like dreaming of you like wanting you so that they don't end up alone so it's kind of like we're taught that we have to have like a man or a partner or somebody to help us get that far in life and it's kind of just putting down like you can't get there yourself you're not gonna end up well off financially stable whatever if you don't look presentable and then end up with somebody who can take you to the finish line. Great. Deep thoughts. Excellent. Okay. Oh, uh, I was just going to say, because you were asking, like, what do men usually do, like, naturally? Um, I would say, like, most men will, like, change their tone and voice before they speak to someone. Because oh <laughs> it's like, when a bunch of people are looking at you, like, all of a sudden, like, you feel like you have to be more, like, I don't know, like, assertive or, like, you have to sound better. So and this is not your voice? No, this is my voice, but I'm just saying, like in gen okay. like in general, like you know, like usually I'm I'm very like like soft spoken with most of my like really close friends, and like other people will be like, oh, like he's really loud and outgoing. So it's like you know, you you kind of change like a little bit of the way that you act in front of like newer people in your life until you become more comfortable as a guy. So Ex excellent point. I, I didn't know uh, revealing more about males. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Um, to kind of add on to that and also earlier about like fixing your hair and all, I think that all goes back to kind of like roles of femininity versus masculinity. Like where uh, most females are expected to be very feminine, you know, like take care of their hair, look in the mirror in the bathroom and fix things up. Whereas like you're talking about being more, um, putting yourself out there, that can be uh, attributed to assertiveness, you know, uh, being strong, having leadership skills, whereas most females are more cater to being supportive rather than the leader. And I think that kind of all ties back to our cultural ideas of what is feminine, what is masculine, and how does that relate to our identity and how that affects our judgment of others. Excellent, that's a great point. Can we do one more or? Sure, one okay, more. We have and, one more. We'll, and everyone write down the key terms, write down the key terms. To add on what she said, um, I took another women's studies class and I remember they, they taught us that men were more associated with culture and women were more of a representation of nature because, of, because they can reproduce, right? And before, they were those who cultivated the land. So they were seen to have like this connection to nature, right? And so I think that ties into this because nature is a representation of beauty. So because women are related to nature, they also have to represent that beauty. So there's this pressure of like, you have to fulfill like, 
your side of your nature, your beautiful nature. Thank you. That's excellent connecting literature. Excellent. Can someone read all the key terms and definitions? And everyone, please write it down. Please write it down. I can read, or or she can, because oh. I, I still have this mic awkwardly over here. <laughs> um, there's cultural mystification, the concealing of historical truth by ideologies, perspective, a method to represent a three-dimensional object, uh, renaissance, rebirth after the Middle Ages to the period in Europe after the Middle Ages, representation, one, an image of a thing, and two, in politics, when a person speaks for someone else. All right, does anyone have any questions on our key terms? Any questions on our key terms? Oh, there is no four. Does everyone have that? Yes? Okay. No. Okay. No. okay. Does everyone have that? All right. Yes, Mr. Renouche. Dr. Bond, I have a question. Um, like, uh, when, when you're talking about seeing the world and stuff, mm -hmm. um, like, what if you've done, like, illicit substances and, like, you see, like, differently, you know, like, it changes your perception? Right. Like, um, how is that classified? Like, does that mean, like, what we're really seeing is just all fake and, like, an illusion or, like, so you're talking about meth, right? Uh, no. No, I've never done meth. Okay, you're talking about LSD. You're talking about LSD. I have never done LSD. Okay, what, what drug are you are you speaking of? I've never done drugs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like I, I've read stories about people that've done drugs. You've read stories about people who've done drugs. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, one could argue that's another prison, right? Because you're it's affecting your seeing. Yeah, that's a great point. Drugs. Not that probably anyone in this class does drugs, but <laughs> if you know someone who does drugs, it does affect their seeing, okay? <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, one thing about seeing uh, that has actually hit the art world, and remember, we're going on a field trip, um, optional field trip. You go by yourself, but we're going to have a day off of class, and I'll be at the Getty, but you guys can go wherever you want. It's extra credit. Um, is this article about uh, the Gorilla Girls? Raise your hand if you heard of Gorilla Girls. One person. All right. What have you heard? Uh, Miss Alyssa, what was a girl girl? I think I'm going to go over here and this, this young man raised his hand first. So. <laughs> um, well, the only thing I've heard about the Gorilla Girls is what you've mentioned and how they um, wanted to give a new perspective on art so, because they weren't getting much attention. So they decided to put on the mask and um, present like a different form of art towards people to get attention that way. Excellent, you're correct. Excellent. Thanks for sharing with the class. Okay. All right. So, Gorilla Girls is an anonymous collective of women, and it started in New York, and there's a history to it. And they pretty much wanted to challenge the exclusion of females in the art world. Um, they went into art galleries, they went to these shows, these like best uh, artists, whatever, and they'd find there's no women, or very few women, right? And so, they had an uh, anonymous collective, they'd have Gorilla Masks. And they would put these flyers all over the museum to indicate their uh, indignation that there's not one female or very, fe very few females that are represented in this grand art. So can someone read our slide? Guerrilla Girls, an activist group challenging art establishment in the U.S., established 1980 to challenge female exclusion in art, changed the number of female art that was shown in museum. 
All right, so they actually were very effective because they would protest. They would go to the museums in New York. They'd all have gorilla masks, and they'd protest outside. They'd go inside and leave uh, uh, gorilla posters and stickers on the exhibit. So it was very effective, and they did um, uh, change some arts, right? And so you think of awkward black. Hello? Okay, so um, awkward black girl is also a form of kind of gorilla girls. All right. Um, hmm. All right. So, has anyone seen this this before? So sometimes at museums you see them stuck. Actually, I've seen them at uh, I've seen that the uh, the Getty before, where people stick them on uh, exhibits. All right. Can someone read it? Do women have to be naked to get into the Metro Museum? Is it Metro Museum? The Met Museum. Less than 5% of the artists in the modern art sections are women, are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. All right, so that's a kind of a gorilla girl. They would have a sticker and they would stick it on the, uh, actually uh, throughout the museum, so it's pretty interesting. All right, so um, they would actually do report cards in uh, New York and they would say like what museum has female uh, representation, what doesn't. Can someone read the slide? Somebody over here raised their hand. Okay. 1970s women art moment helped women create, exhibit, and control their works. 1984 protests outside the museum to call out instances of exclusion. All right, so when you guys, if you were to do the extra credit, um, again, it's optional, you would probably want to comment on the museum and if it had any female, um, female kind of... Um, displays. To thank our sponsor, the Ellen Stone Bellick Institute, for the, two stu for the study of women and gender in arts and media um, that, dedicated to the, that are dedicated to the creation of the new works, scholarships, education, and programming about women and gender, gender in arts and media. Does it take a penis to paint? Museums like the Met and MoMA have historically seemed to think so. In 1985, a group of feminist artists joined together in New York City and <laughs> in New York City and formed a group called the Gorilla Girls. And their mission for the last 25 plus years has been to change their minds. They have traveled from country to country and protest museums all over the world and are here today to tell us th about their journey and what it means to be a Gorilla Girl. Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. It's great to see so many of you out there. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start with an interview. Um, we'll just make all the noise. Okay, we're fine. Okay. Um, what was your guys' first protest like? Ah, well, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Frida Kahlo, and I'm here with my colleague, Katya Kolwitz. And uh, we're founding members of the Grill Girls. We've been involved in the group ever since it started. Uh, we actually called the first meeting, and we've been involved in just about everything the Grill Girls have done. So, our first protest. Well, in 1985, before most of you were born, uh, <laughs> the Museum of Modern Art uh, had an uh, an exhibition that they called an International Survey of Painting and Sculpture, which was supposed to be, you know, a survey of all the most significant art in the world, in, well, in the Western world. Um, what we noticed was that out of uh, almost 200 artists, there were only 17 women and even fewer artists of color. And we knew there was something wrong with that picture. We didn't know what to do about it, but we knew that that was not a story of the culture that we belong to. So, Katja and I went to a, a very traditional protest where people were carrying placards and shouting. And we joined in, and at the end of the day, we only made people angry, people going in and out of the museum. Um, we realized that they thought that the art world, they assumed the art world was a meritocracy, and whatever was presented to them by the museums and the curators had to be the most significant 
art of that time and in fact the art history of that time. So uh, Katya and I took a vow that day that we were going to find some way, some new way to make people wake up and realize that there was a lot of discrimination, both conscious and unconscious, in the art world. Great, so you saw a founding member of the Gorilla Girls. All right, so um, again, the Gorilla Girls, what, a, what, what their big, huge uh, push is they want more female artists to be displayed, right, more um, equal. All right, guys, let's talk midterm. Take out a sheet of paper. Uh, the midterm is going to be 45 questions and three essays, okay? Uh, it's going to be true, false, multiple choice, and matching. All right, so there's going to be around 20 true, false, around 20 match, uh, 20 multiple choice, and uh, you know five to ten matching. You're going to have three essays tonight. I will send you the three essays. Okay, so you're going to prepare. It's going to you're going to have a selection of five essays, and you're going to have to write about three of them. Okay, so I'm going to send you those essays tonight. Okay, so again, you're going to be given five essays, and you have to write about three of them on the day of. Okay, so please bring a, a, a scantron as well as a blue sheet. Okay. Um, yes. Question. The typical one to fifty. The one to fifty. The the skinny one that's green that's on both sides. The A A two. Yes. Yeah. All right. So um, so the question is always like, what are you going to be studied on? Uh, what are you gonna, you're going to be asked questions on who, what, where, when, and how of each author. Okay. Who what, where, when, how, and why of each author, okay? So let's uh, do it together. Let's do one together. All right. Um, who has their global women on them? Let's do it together. So these are the questions that you would be asked. Something about the who, what, when, where, how, okay? All right. Let's do it together. Let's do uh, Filipina or, okay, thank you. Let's do um, Perennis. Okay, let's do Perennis. All right. Remember the Filipina uh, maids, right? All right. So let's do together. Um, who was who that story about? Or what is, what, what is that story about? What is the what? Does anyone know? So um, basically, uh, Parreñas talks about... Um, the strain uh, many of these kids have to live with um, not having their mothers with them. Um, <clears throat> she discusses how many of these are could be positively um, affected by other family members, and um, as well they could be um, negatively affected by those who don't have close family members that can help them with their school. All right, excellent. Correct. You're totally correct, okay? So wh what I want you to do is go through all the readings and answer who, what, where, when, how, and why, okay, for all the readings. There will also be uh, three essays, okay? So again, um, I actually did t uh, take some questions from you guys, right? So you actually wrote a, a big chunk of it. Um, some of the questions that you asked were something like, so someone actually asked this in class. Um, guys so that's one of your questions uh, that your fellow student wrote uh, what's the answer a okay so you, you could tell it's a who question or a what question okay so uh, go through all the readings and, and actually have a study this way is put your readings in a box and then put down who what where and have everything answered okay so tonight um, I live in Pasadena so I'll have to drive home it'll be like 11 but I'm gonna send you the actual essay questions okay so you're gonna have five essays and you have to write on three of the essays okay so you have to bring a, a blue book as well as a scantron question when you say 
they're essay questions uh, th that uh, some of you guys wrote, and I just combined together. Yeah. So usually they're five-part uh, question essays because we, we want you to know, like, you know, have you been reading, right? So basically, the, the questions are something like, you know, wh what is global inequality for women? Can you cite six examples of, of course, Dominican Republic, uh, Thailand. Um, uh, and you're, and you're short besides, uh, made in China. So give me six examples, cite the name and the author, title, etc. The usual, it's an essay, it's a full essay. Okay? So you're gonna be given exactly the actual essay question. Okay? So you have to come prepared with, to be, to be able to write. Some of them are overlapping questions, that, so some of them, over, so it's, it's fine if you use the same. Okay? Alright, any other questions? All right, so you get that tonight, and that's it. So um, I think you'll do great. Um, if you come to class every class, it'll be great for you, okay? So if not, I'm, I'm here after, so if you can ask me questions. All right, wonderful class, guys. Deep conversation. Thank you. You guys are awesome.